Um, yeah, so hopefully that's useful for you. Uh, I'll have office hours today from 11 to 12, so please come by if you have questions on things. Um, yeah, any questions, concerns? Oh, right, and I have, uh, I'll have uh, Anmol administer the, the surveys, so he'll come in at like 10-ish and collect them from you afterward. Um, because I guess I probably shouldn't be here for that. So, uh, any questions before we get started? Concerns? Random thoughts? Uh, probably. I think I can. Yeah, it might have to be like later in the day, but okay. Any time. Okay, uh, I'll see you what I can work out, and I'll send out a Canvas announcement for it. Okay, other things? All right, cool. Everybody ready and excited for the quarter to be over? You're almost there. <laughs> Understandable. Um, okay, so the final is non-cumulative. So I'll try not to have any questions specifically relating to topics before the midterm or that were on the midterm. Uh, we'll start off, again, it was, it was starting off with bending. So for bending, uh, there's two important ones to remember. Uh, it's three point and four point. Generally how we set up those types of problems, if I have a load P, know the maximum moment um, is at the middle of the beam. So remember the shear moment diagrams that we had written out. I'm not going to actually write them because they take a little bit of time, but uh, the maximum moment is the moment where x is L over 2, um, where this is a beam of length L, uh, and that's L over 4. The max deflection is also in the center. W at L over 2, uh, which is equal to PL cubed over 48 EI. Uh, and again, that's it kind of follows a, a cubic deflection there. The other, uh, so this is 3 points. There's also 4 point bending a little bit longer. This one, I have some P, P over 2, P over 2, again simply supported on a roller. Uh, the moment, the maximum moment, um, is the moment from anywhere between x is equal to, if I say this is at some point A, this is at some point L minus A, where the beam is length L. The moment is constant through the midsection. So this is anywhere between x equals A uh, to x is L minus A. And it's P A over 2. The W max uh, is P A over, or is also in the center of the beam. Uh, and it's PA over 48 E I times 3 L cubed minus 4 A cubed. No, squared. Sorry. Because that squared. Okay. Um, so these are the general bending relationships you should remember. You've gone through these in your, in your bending lab, so hopefully they're somewhat familiar. Um, remember now for this I, there's only two I's you should have down, and that's the I, this is the bending er, or area moment of inertia, uh, or second moment of area. I is pi over four R to the fourth for a circle. Um, and I is E H cubed over 12 for a rectangle. So this is again the the area moment, I around that neutral axis, and 
for a rectangle of width b and height h. That's the uh, that's the i around this axis around the center axis. So for a circle and for a rectangle. Um, plasticity uh, is all my sheets. There we go. So we got into bending plasticity. So plasticity in beams. Plasticity in beams. Uh, so for this one, I had shown there was a couple of relationships when uh, I have some moment in a beam M. Uh, technically, this was for three-point bending, so the moment wasn't uniform in here. But um, at some point, I'll have the top surface um, reach a, a, a stress of sigma y. Uh, this would be in tension. This would be in compression on the sides here. Um, and there's a certain bending moment where that happens. So the m i where plasticity initiates, initiates, and that m i was um, right. Sorry, for these, your stress sigma is m c over i, where c is two times the height. But this should also be a relationship that's fairly familiar. Um, so the max stress is at the top and the bottoms. The bending moment where plasticity starts to initiate um, is sigma y i over c, where cn is that half height of the beam. Um, and then you get some sort of a profile along the height of the beam, sigma, where uh, this is some sigma y on the top. sigma y on the bottom, minus sigma y along the z-axis. Um, if I keep deforming it, if I apply a higher moment, or generally a higher load, um, if m is greater than mi, then I have kind of a big plastic section in there, uh, in the top and bottom. That general m uh, is kind of a longer equation. This was derived for a square, <coughs> beam, a square beam specifically, uh, and that's b sigma y c squared times 1 minus sigma y over e squared over 3 epsilon c squared. Um, and so that's where this has started to yield and has uh, this is again for an elastic, plas elastic, perfectly plastic beam. So we assume that the once it's plastically deformed, there's just kind of a constant stress along the side, or along the the, the part where it's yielded of sigma y, and then at some point I get to um, a point where there's a full plastic hinge in the beam. Pull this in where m is equal to m naught, so plastic hinge. And this m naught happens where uh, this is 3 halves mi, or 3 sigma y i over c 2c. Um, and this is where I have the whole thing um, across the cross section is basically fully plastically deformed. There's always going to be some elastic region in the center, but at some point we assume that that, that part that's elastic is very small relative to the total height of the beam. Uh, this is again sigma, sigma, this is at some sigma y minus sigma y. Okay. Um, and I'll be posting uh, more slightly more detailed notes, or at least cleaner notes, on on Canvas sometime. Uh, we went through strain gauges. 
you don't need to worry too much about strain gauges vinyl. Um, so I have them in the, the notes that I'll post, but generally it's good to understand what they are and how they are used, but I probably won't have you test you on actually on anything related to strain gauges. Um, but buckling, buckling will come up. So there's one, there's one relationship in particular where buckling, uh, that's important to buckling. That's the P critical is pi squared E I over K L squared, um, where K is an effective length factor. Effective length factor. And this changes depending on the boundary condition of the beam. So now um, if I have a fixed fixed condition that K is equal to one half, and when I buckle my beam, it'll turn out something like that. So this is fix, fix, fix. Um, I can have a pinned, pinned condition. And when I buckle my beam, it kind of ends up something like that. This is for a K equals one. And, and and so this was the general case that was first derived when looking at beam buckling, so that's kind of the, the reference length for all of the buckling stuff. Um, remember why this is one. So it's it's a transition between a bent state and a uniaxially uniaxially compressed state. We can come up with some derivation and it's it's the when the sign of of that internal thing is equal to zero, then you get an instability. Um, but really the important thing to know is this equation. Uh, there's a fixed pinned condition. So um, I can have fix on the top and then pinned on the bottom. And when I push down on that, this K is approximately equal to 0 0.7 fixed pinned and we had actually shown where that comes from. It's like the, the <coughs> x equals tangent of x, where x is that pi, uh, p square root of e thing in the middle. Uh, this ends up something like that, where you have zero deflection there at the top. And then you have a fixed free condition, uh, where k is equal to 2, 2 for fixed. Um, and for this one, you end up kind of with something like that, that bows out after it's buckled. And again, this takes on half, half the shape of uh, this k equals 1, which is why the effective length is 2, which is where this whole idea came from. Uh, there's a critical transition slenderness ratio. Um, so between when, when yielding happens, when yielding uh, transitions to buckling, I had that S uh, transition is pi over K square root of E over sigma Y, sigma Y. And so this is the one that you would use in your lab report so hopefully, again, you're familiar with it, where S is the slenderness uh, and is equal to L over square root of I over A. Yes, slenderness. Um, so this should all hopefully be fairly familiar because you had done a lab on it. Um, but that one equation in particular, this one is important to know that P critical when buckling happens, or the load at which buckling will start. Uh, okay, stress concentrations. We're doing, we're doing okay. So, uh, stress concentrations. This one is specifically for a circular hole in a plate. If I have a far field 
applied stress, some sigma infinity, and I have a hole in the center of my plate, um, I'm going to get a tensile stress here at the top and a compressive stress here on the sides. This tensile stress is going to be three sigma infinity, and this compressive stress is going to be negative sigma infinity. It'll be the same on the other sides, negative sigma infinity, three sigma infinity. Um, so this is uh, the one general case you know, or you, need, you should know. Uh, also remember that this comes from that function where uh, I'm looking at the hoop stress and the hoop stress at r is equal to a, where a is the radius of the hole, uh, is sigma infinity one plus two cosine of two theta minus cosine two theta? Minus cosine two theta. Sorry, minus cosine two theta. Um, and so this is where that if theta is something, you get three. If theta is something else, one minus two goes to negative one, one plus two goes to three, and it varies around here. Um, and know how this combines in different loading states. So in particular, remember that if I have a far field stress that is a biaxial stress. Uh, and these are both sigma infinity. You can superimpose them. So this is the same thing as taking one plate uh, with plus another plate with stress going out and stress going up. So I can combine the stress concentrations due to this. Here at the top, I would have three minus one, three minus, or three minus one. Here at the side, I would have, th again, three minus one. And all of these end up being two sigma infinity, two sigma infinity, two and two. Um, and so know how this combines. And this was one of the homework problems specifically for shear. You, you take it and you rotate it and you have a stress going one way and a stress going, or uniaxial stress going one way and uniaxial stress going the other way. But as long as you can relate it back to this one case, you can kind of add them together, however. Um, okay, then we got into fracture, fracture mechanics. Um, any questions so far on things? Okay. Okay. So, fracture. Um, there was our three different fracture modes. So, the one, two, and three uh, were normal. Applied normal stress is mode one. <coughs> applied shear stress is mode two. And um, out of plane shear is mode three. So remember, this is the way that most materials fail, this mode one fracture. So this is all the time when we write K1. K1C, that's the, so we, depending on the fracture mode, we have a K, which is a critic, a stress intensity factor. Stress intensity factor. And I can say my K1, for example, is the stress intensity factor due to a mode one failure. This comes from geometry. So from geometry, and it's specifically sigma infinity square root pi a. If this is so, this is for a, a semi-infinite plate or for a large, a large part with a small crack in it. If there's a finite size crack, then you have some factor out here in front. Don't worry about too. Don't worry about that too much. Just know that that's the case. Um, we can say now failure for a part will happen when I get to some critical stress intensity factor, some KIC 
is my critical K1. Um, and I say that this is a material property. So this one, we specifically test out different parts and say whenever that, if I know what size a crack is, um, I know when my part will fail. Uh, this, I can also relate back to uh, an energy release rate. So this critical K1 is also known as my fracture toughness. And we kind of went through what some numbers were for different types of parts, um, what a high and a low KIC meant, um, although it isn't always intuitive. We can also relate it to a G, which is our uh, energy release rate. Energy release rate. Um, and that G is K squared over E, KC squared over E. And so this one is our uh, fracture energy, energy. Um, also sometimes referred to as the tear ability. So how easy it is to, to tear or rip apart, how much energy I have to put in to actually rip something. So that KIC for some soft materials can be low um, because the part is inherently very flexible, um, but could still have a high G because it's very difficult to tear. So natural rubber is a nice example of that. Um, we looked, oh, uh, one more important thing to remember is the factor of safety. Factor of safety. So that for fracture, so we defined it for plasticity, where it was the, the yield stress over the applied stress. For fracture, we're specifically looking at the critical stress intensity uh, over the, the stress intensity that we're actually applying. Um, you can also say that this is KIC over sigma infinity square root pi A. Um, where A again is is the size of your crack. Uh, okay, more fracture stuff. Went through a lot of fracture. So there will most definitely be a fracture problem, possibly two, probably two. Um, yeah. So uh, the midterm uh, will be basically the same format as before. So four conceptual questions, four numerical questions, and then I'll have an extra credit problem um, related to something that you may know but haven't explicitly been taught or tested on. Um, so the um, I've tried to gear it down a little bit and I've tried to add more figures, tried to make everything more explicit. So hopefully there shouldn't be too much ambiguity in the questions, um, which for some of the problems on the midterm, there may have been some confusion about exactly what we were looking for. This one should be hopefully more straightforward. Um, yeah, but just as a heads up, so you know what to expect. Um, more fracture stuff. So we had gone through linear elastic fracture mechanics. So L, E, F, M. So that's linear elastic fracture mechanics. Um, and I had shown, basically this is looking at what the stress distribution in a part is for a given crack. So we had found that all of the stresses are proportional to that K1 over square root of 2 pi r with some function of theta here on the side, um, plus some higher order terms. But the important thing to know uh, is that 1 over square root r squared r. So theoretically you have an infinite stress from linear elastic fracture mechanics. You have an infinite stress at the crack tip. That's never actually the case. And so that's not the case because plasticity happens at the crack. So when I have an actual crack, um, my linear elastic fracture would predict an infinite stress that kind of decays. Realistically I have some plastic zone out here, some rp where I have some plastic process that's happening. 
that's not always explicitly plasticity, but um, for metals, that is a plastic zone. So metals are stickly deforming in this region near the crack tip. Uh, for metal plasticity, plastic. For polymers, you actually get something that's more like a crazing. So crazing or tearing with some of the polymer uh, polymer molecules kind of getting axially aligned in the crack region. So this is a polymer and a ceramic. You have, you still have a high stress zone around here, but then you end up with micro cracking in that high stress zone. So this would be micro cracking for a ceramic. Um, the size of that pla or sorry, this is valid when the plastic zone, so this bar assumption is valid, LEFM is valid when RP is much smaller than your part size. Um, so the size of this plastic zone has to be small relative to the actual part, which can sometimes if you want to test something like a very tough steel, it can mean that you need parts that are feet or sometimes meters across in order to actually get that LEFM condition to work. Um, but yeah, that's a side note. Um, the size of that plastic zone, RP for metals specifically, is on the order of one over two pi um, KIC over sigma yield squared. Uh, and so that's an approximation of how big the size of the plastic zone is for metals in particular. Um, we'd also talked about a Weibull distribution of failure. Um, so Weibull, and that was specifically the, the F, the failure, failure probability. is equal to uh, 1 minus the exponent of v over v naught negative um, sigma over sigma naught to the m. So this question was the last one in the homework problem. Um, how does how that m change with a different distribution of, of uh, flaws in your material? Um, so kind of, and uh, there was a question in the practice sheets, how does that volume change, or how does changing that volume affect your failure probability? Um, in general, it's smaller parts have smaller distributions of flaws, and so they're less likely to fail, um, or have smaller big flaws, and so they're less likely to fail. Um, and the more narrow your flaw distribution is, the higher that M value is. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so sigma naught, sigma naught and v naught are reference properties, but sigma naught is the generally defined as the stress where f is equal to half. So it's the stress at which half of your parts have failed. There we go. Um, and v naught is the volume for a given sigma naught, because remember your sigma naught is actually dependent on what the volume of your part is, uh, and your M is a Weibull modulus. And where M being low, M is low, means you have um, lots, of dif lots of differently sized flaws of random sized flaws. M being high means you have a narrow distribution of flaws. Okay. Um, I may put a question on Weibull in there. 
fifty fifty. Like it's it's kind of I'm leaning toward not including one, but know it just in case. If I do, it'll be a conceptual one. Okay. Um, there was the last two topics we got into were viscoelasticity and fatigue. So visco elasticity. Um, so for viscoelasticity, know that so generally what we're talking about is creep and relaxation creep and relaxation and this is generally for polymers um, the time scale at which creep happens so the time scale is something on the order of the exponent of minus e to the t over eta um, or the xp of minus t over tau where uh, eta is my viscosity all materials have some viscosity generally polymer viscosities are much higher than those of metals and those of uh, ceramics uh, technically, metal ceramics glasses all have a viscosity, but they're so high that we kind of ignore them for the most part. So it's only really polymers that have a, a considerably, considerably low viscosity that these that this uh, actually affects things. Um, then there was the only numerical question. If I ask you one, will be on the Maxwell model, uh, which was that um, I, which we use to find relaxation. So for relaxation, if I apply some initial epsilon naught, my stress will decay exp to the minus et over eta. And so this is valid for soft materials and uh, molten molten glass or metal is where it actually gets kind of used. So think, so think about glass blowing. Um, yeah, so I'll probably have a conceptual question on viscoelasticity. It, it is unlikely that I'll, that I'll throw a numerical question at you, but if it is, it's Maxwell, uh, or it'll be related to Maxwell, just because we haven't actually done anything with it in a lab or um, in a homework at all. Uh, then the last topic is fatigue. <coughs> which for fatigue, there was that SN curve that we showed. Um, there's low, high cycle fatigue, and eventually an endurance limit, uh, where this happens on the order of 10 to the 3. This happens on the order of 10 to the 6. Number of cycles to failure. Uh, stress amplitude. Not all materials have an endurance limit. So something like a steel would have an endurance limit. So after a certain number of cycles, it kind of plateaus. And something like aluminum doesn't. It just kind of con continues to degrade over time. Um, the These have some slope. Some, oh, I... These have some slope, B, uh, and we can relate that fatigue to sigma amplitude or stress amplitude is equal to sigma F prime times 2N F to the B or um, A N F to the B where B is equal to B. They just call them different Bs by convention. Um, so that you know which one they're referring to. Uh, we had looked into Goodman relationships and Palmer meter, which describe how this changes with different mean stresses and different um, and different types of cycles. Don't worry about that too much. But for fatigue, what you should know is Paris's law. Paris's law. So specifically what that's talking about 
um, is if I start off with some crack A, as I pull it, this is four metals, um, as I pull it, it, and I unload it, it opens up by a little bit, so A plus delta A after each loading cycle, uh, and the amount that it opens up, dA dN, is equal to, we're now relating it to the stress intensity factor, to that K to the M, where M is on the order of like three to four-ish. Um, but conceptually, this is the important thing to know about. So for viscoelasticity and for fatigue, it's unlikely that I'll ask you a numerical problem, but do understand conceptually what's going on for each of these, why viscoelasticity takes place, how generally the, the time scale goes on, what materials it's valid for fatigue, um, generally what to expect from different materials, and microstructurally why that's happening. Um, and then I think that is all the material for the midterm. Yeah. Oh, right. That it's just some, uh, just a reference. It's just a reference stress where here, if I interpolated this line up, the point where this crosses that line that would be my sigma f prime for, for zero cycles. Well, technically it's a, because on a log plot, zero is in, in negative infinity, but this is a where then a is sigma f uh, prime times 2b. Yeah? Was the no cheat double-sided? Uh, I was planning to have a single-sided no cheat uh, normal size. Uh, it's probably fine if it's double sided. Yeah. Yeah. We, you you can go for double sided. That's okay. So, so you can do du double sided, uh, hand handwritten normal a uh, eight and a half by eleven note sheet. All six sides. You can do a hexaflexigram. Okay, other questions on things?